Reading will start shortly. The proceeding 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 will start shortly. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State, for appearing before the European Scrutiny Committee this afternoon. Today we will question you on the Government's Northern Ireland Protocol negotiations and the Windsor Framework. The background to this session, I have to say, we all agree, is far from ideal. First, the Prime Minister declined to appear before us to answer questions on the deal he negotiated and presented to the House only three weeks ago. And such is the importance of the Windsor framework, we felt it necessary to outline our initial concerns in the report, which is highly unusual. Secondly, it has proven especially difficult to secure a minister before us. We do appreciate your appearance today, but it must be said that for matters of such political, legal and constitutional significance, it is incumbent on government to be proactive in its engagement with select committees and more generally the House and in relation to our very specific standing orders. Effective scrutiny is a hallmark of good law and improves rather than hinders its, its achievement. Thirdly, the timing and sequence of UK EU level events have been an ongoing concern to us. As we warned in our report only last Tuesday, the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee will meet on Friday to agree the Windsor Framework. 
This is only three days from our session now and two from the Stormont Brake Statutory Instrument debate, which is tomorrow. We will consider the SIs and its appropriateness later, but there appears to be no good reason for this artificial timeline, which sees the government signing off a text published weeks ago with no change. We were promised engagement, but the government has failed to deliver anything meaningful. This impromptu session and tomorrow's 90-minute vote on approving an SI is all we will, we will have had. It appears clear to us that the government set its course weeks, if not months ago, and has done all it can to avoid being diverted from it. The Windsor framework is a significant development in the UK's post-Brexit relationship with the EU. Its legal complexity speaks to this, and there's a vast amount of paperwork, as you know, and its provisions would impact the people and businesses of Northern Ireland and Great Britain. It is therefore deeply disappointing that we find ourselves here today. On the content of today's session, we will cover timing, sequence and scrutiny of the Windsor framework and related matters, the framework itself including the Stormont break, applicable EU law in Northern Ireland, the European Court of Justice, VAT, State Aid and Red and Green Lanes domestic policy and legal implications, and next steps. So before we start, perhaps you'd like to say a few words, Secretary of State. Also, Mr. Davis and Mr. Threlfall, perhaps you would also like to introduce yourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, and um, thank you for the invite. I, 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 I completely understand what you, you said but um, uh, about getting, some, uh, getting the Prime Minister before you, but he does go before uh, <coughs> Uh, a, a committee of this house on, on, on a regular basis for an overall uh, hear, hearing on all sorts of things. However, when you contacted me at the weekend, um, you know, as a long-standing former member of this committee, um, I was, I'd like to think you felt that I was delighted to accept your invitation. I was very glad, if I may say so, that you responded so rapidly. And, um, and I am genuinely happy to be before this committee uh, today. I know this was as you say, hastily arranged, and, um, and forgive me uh, for not having uh, uh, um, as much time as you, you, you might possibly like uh, to go through all, all, these, uh, all these matters. Um, however, um, I, I, and I am joined um, by uh, Mark Davies and Brendan Threffel. Um, I've said, said that wrong, haven't I? Three, four, no, something like that. Um, who are like, I guess, as, as a football referee, um, I've got Mitrovic, Mitrovic and Silva. Uh, either side of me. They've been um, from the Cabinet Office and involved in this for a very long period of time. Um, my primary objective as Secretary of State uh, for Northern Ireland is to get the Northern Ireland Executive and the Assembly up and running. Um, the day-to-day -day application of the protocol as it currently stands has meant this is not able to happen at this point for very good reason that everybody on this committee will know. Um, the Windsor Framework represents an important opportunity for a turning point for Northern Ireland. The framework protects the economic rights of the people of Northern Ireland and provides us with a basis to move forward together as one united country. It deals with the everyday issues that people and businesses in Northern Ireland had faced as a result of the operation of the protocol. We have rewritten the protocol treaty and replaced it with a radical, legally binding new Windsor framework, something many said could not be done. The agreement removes the Irish, bo Irish Sea border um, and restores the free flow of trade from GB to NI through a new green lane. It gives the people of Northern Ireland a veto over new laws that apply there and protects Northern Ireland's place in our union through fixing practical problems, including on pets, parcels, medicines, and ensuring that the UK decisions on tax and spend uh, benefit people and businesses in Northern Ireland as they do in Great Britain. It goes further than the July 2021 command paper and protocol bill in crucial areas and restores that delicate balance inherent in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and, importantly, brings stability for business. The committee will be aware uh, that we have begun the process of domestic implementation of the framework, as you, uh, as you mentioned, with the draft uh, regulations giving effect to the storm and break. And I very much look forward to taking your questions uh, and to set out why I believe these new arrangements uh, will have delivered on what the government set out to deliver <clears throat> and be, to be the best outcome for Northern Ireland and the UK as a whole. Thank you very much. So, Secretary of State, um, 
for the questions, because you only have a shortish time on this, as you appreciated and you just mentioned, uh, so for the questions that we don't manage to cover, will you commit with your army of officials, if I may put it that way around, uh, to answer them in writing and commit to do so before tomorrow's vote if we send them to you after the session is finished? I'll, do, I, I'll absolutely do my best. I'm, the Northern Ireland office does not have an army of officials, but I'm sure the Cabinet office has a, um, some spare that can more, help. I was thinking much more about the whole entire grouping of the yeah. government machine behind this. It's been going on for months. I will endeavour to get you uh, that reply. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, so what is the Windsor framework? Because the public, I think, probably would like to hear from you. And why should MPs support it when the UK has left the European Union, but the citizens of Northern Ireland are still being subjugated to EU law? Yeah, I mean, the Windsor framework, um, well, as I hope I said in my opening remarks, that um, the Windsor framework actually involves a fundamental a bunch of changes to the old protocol, uh, one which many in this particular committee voted for, I voted uh, for, uh, and establishes entirely new arrangements for UK in, internal UK trade in a deal that tries to identify um, the full range of issues uh, that Northern Ireland has been uh, coming under over the last two years. Um, there's an element, uh, so uh, as, as I said, as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, there, there are some significant issues uh, and the everyday delivery of public services to people in Northern Ireland, which are being exacerbated by not having a functioning executive or assembly um, that is sitting. Uh, and I know that the, the reason for this, uh, as well articulated, is that the practical issues of the current protocol are causing a great disturbance amongst one particular community, the unionist community, at this point in time. So the Windsor framework is a... Uh, a way of trying to address <coughs> those concerns um, amongst that community and all, com all communities in Northern Ireland, um, because I've met with every party leader on a number of occasions in Northern Ireland, and they all have certain issues with the current functioning of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Some obviously want to see it maintained in, in a very similar state to the uh, way it is now, but uh, others wanted uh, the, uh, these new uh, fundamental change. Those practical issues, just so we can, um, uh, so I can highlight them for you, were gradually, as the protocol got enacted, and remember it's not been completely enacted at this point, various goods started to disappear from the shelves of shops and supermarkets in Northern Ireland. GB companies were choosing, whether for good reason or bad, not to supply Northern Ireland because of issues with the Northern Ireland protocol, various goods. Uh, various goods were actually almost prescribed uh, by the current functioning of the, of the protocol. And for those of us based mm. in GB, yeah. you can hear this. On, you, you don't need me to demonstrate this to you, because if you listen to any advert on commercial radio that's advertising a good, it will invariably say at the end of it in the financial small print, this thing is not available in NI. So every day, un, uh, uh, unionists were uh, quite rightly... Um, questioning whether they were being pulled within, pulled out of the orbit of the UK internal market and pulled with, uh, into the orbit of the EU single market. Businesses in Northern Ireland, and lots of them, um, also wanted to maintain the access that they had to the European single market. And I, um, I, I've had letters from numerous um, Northern Ireland MPs mm -hmm asking about how this could be maintained in the run-up to, to this process. Um, uh, one was contacted me saying, the big, uh, uh, concerned about what the outcomes might be. Would there be dual regulation in the future? Uh, and it, uh, I had a letter from a member of parliament outlining the, the Austria Farmers Union have raised the, those issues around dual regulation because it would have to run essentially two lines for each product that it was producing and, and uh, massively increasing its costs. Um, and that, that MP, um, uh, wrote to me uh, uh, highlighting those concerns, but equally highlighting that business's interest in maintaining its access to the European single market as well as the... Well, you've made that point, and I'm very grateful to you because we've got so many questions. Go on. Yeah, absolutely. Quite rightly said, I don't want to cut you short, but on the other hand, we have got a lot of questions to ask. So I was going to ask one more question, which is, 
Of course, Section 38 of the Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 enables the Northern Ireland Protocol to be overridden by the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. So why has the government stated it is withdrawing it? Um, because uh, the legal basis for the bill has fallen away with this negotiated settlement, as detailed by um, uh, the legal statement that went alongside this. Well, I know there's been a lot of comment about this. The basis of necessity, which was, a, 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 I know. Which was uh, as you know, being it's tested. Well trashed by some. Yeah, it was a bit, made I think it's government. fair to say it was being tested rather than trashed. It was being tested um, by uh, uh, various lawyers and indeed the European uh, Union itself, European Commission itself. But the basis of necessity um, uh, has essentially been removed by uh, it did the pass new. The House of Commons. It did pass the House of Commons unamended and it reached the House of Lords, and at the moment it's sitting there, like the Mary Celeste, in the House of Lords, um, marooned, becalmed, and it's now being stated in your papers that it's going to be withdrawn, although you can't withdraw it. It wouldn't House be withdrawn, as you, uh, as you and I are probably two of the few people. But as, for, as, a, as a former chief whip of the government, um, I was pleased to be able to deliver an unamended bill all the way through the House of, the House of Commons process. Um, and I watched it as it was gradually uh, entering the very calm waters that it, uh, it faced in the House of Lords. Um, obviously, uh, you don't, uh, bills don't really get amended uh, until they've gone beyond committee stage in the House of Lords. I think it would be fair to say that the bill, whilst, uh, whilst now currently in pristine condition, possibly wouldn't have come back from the House of Lords in, in, in that place, but that's what the Commons is there for, to uh, uh, sort that out. But, but the basis for the bill is, is essentially gone because the basis of necessity has, has been removed. Right, so I'm now going to move to uh, Greg Smith, please. Thank you, Chairman. Secretary of State, uh, good afternoon. I'd like to probe a little bit around the definition of sovereignty because when making his statement on the Windsor Framework on the 27th of February, the Prime Minister spoke of how the framework will, and I quote, safeguard the sovereignty of the people of Northern Ireland. Now, as a relatively simple soul, I define sovereignty as whereby laws are set by the country that they cover, where the highest arbiter of those laws are national courts. We can see from the Windsor framework that even the concessions that clearly are in it are done through amendment to EU law as opposed to any national law. So can you run us through what, what is actually meant by safeguarding the sovereignty of the people of Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, and actually thank you for um, uh, spotting that there has been um, some positive movement. Um, I know some might ju judge it as not <coughs> enough, but I don't think... Um, when the Prime Minister introduced the Windsor Framework, um, he did state that it was... Uh, not perfect, um, but actually, uh, from I, I would say from from the point for, uh, from which we came, this is a massive, massive improvement in um, how things will operate for Northern Ireland. He also said, um, and this is uh, as I was making clear to the chairman, um, that because of the land border that uh, Northern Ireland has with Ireland itself, um, and uh, because of uh, us wanting to ensure that we protect our UK internal market and the European Union ensuring it wants to protect its single market and businesses in Northern Ireland, manufacturing businesses in Northern Ireland wanting to maintain their current access to the European single market um, that we spent a lot of time talking to and listening to various businesses and, uh, and groups about how that can best be dealt with. What this does this deal does, and I'll come to the sovereignty point in a second, um, what this does is it strips away um, hundreds of pages of, disapplies hundreds of pages of EU law as they apply to Northern Ireland at this point. Um, it, it's about, I think it's 67 different uh, laws, EU law, something like that, anyway. Um, there are, I could make it a lot more pages if I increase the font, but it's, um, uh, it strips away lo lots of that, but it does maintain some aspects, about 3%, we, uh, just under 3%, we reckon, uh, of existing EU law as it applies through the Northern Ireland Protocol um, at this current point. Um, uh, it does maintain that, which is the, uh, what we believe is the bare minimum required 
for that free-flowing access to the European single market for manufactured goods in Northern Ireland. Um, the sovereignty point is that um, I, I, I've had, uh, I mean, lots and lots of comments from different people over a long period of time about where the current protocol has no actual democratic input at all. People in Northern Ireland not having any say over the laws uh, that affect them and how they, how they feed through uh, the system. What we've done is introduce uh, the Stormont break, which I know we'll come on to later, which does effectively um, give people in Northern Ireland a say over those remaining EU laws, that new laws that come in, amend laws, current laws that are amended, um, it does give them a say uh, over, th over those and whether they should apply um, to Northern Ireland in the future. And the ultimate act of sovereignty is that actually, in a year's time, in just over a year's time, the Northern Ireland Assembly, on a majority vote, could vote to reject the whole thing itself. Just coming back very briefly on that point, because I'm conscious of time, is the, and then others will come on to the storm on break <clears throat> specifically later, is the clue not in the question that there is no UK legislation or indeed anything that Stormont could pass that enables any of the concessions that we're talking about here? It is EU law itself that has to be amended to allow for the green lanes, etc., and to allow for the Stormont break, therefore meaning EU law continues to be sovereign over Northern Ireland. With the greatest of respect, um, what we are doing in the House tomorrow is uh, we are passing a piece of legislation through this House to enact part of this deal. Doubtless there will be other future legislation and indeed there will be things that will doubtless flow um, from Joint Committee and beyond. But um, this is, uh, you know, there's agreements on both sides of this and, uh, and indeed um, I would say compromise on both sides. Okay, colleagues will come into that in more detail. Can I just ask one slightly different question about the <coughs> statutory instrument that we have 90 minutes debate on and a vote tomorrow in the House of Commons? Going back to the 27th of February when the Prime Minister announced the Windsor Framework, he talked of Parliament <coughs> having a say over the Windsor Framework. Tomorrow we're looking at a very specific part of it, the Stormont break. There is some speculation that tomorrow's vote is actually being considered as the whole say over the entire Windsor framework, a, a meaningful vote, if I can put it that way, on the whole deal. What is the government's official position on the vote that we are being asked to take part in tomorrow? Um, it's the factual position that this is a vote on the SI that activates the Stormont break. I, I believe Mr Davis just wanted to come in very briefly. Uh, it was, <clears throat> sorry, it was just on your previous question because it's, it's probably important to, to clarify that several of the, and in fact important elements of these changes are not made through changes to EU law. So the Stormont break is a change to the treaty itself. So we're using the uh, changes to the withdrawal, withdrawal agreement text. Uh, similarly, the VAT and excise rule changes, they're sort of done through changes to the treaty. So these are, there are various elements of that kind which are actually made through changes to the, to the withdrawal agreement itself, not to changes to, um, to EU law. And obviously the elements of the customs green lane that we're talking about there is set out in a joint committee decision, uh, which is part of the discussions that the chair referenced on, on Friday at the withdrawal agreement joint committee. So my last question is, when will the House of Commons and Parliament have a say on the whole of the Windsor framework. Um, as we've said from the very start, from the 27th, we're going to give, uh, and I'd like to think this has been demonstrated by action, people time and space to consider everything that we are doing here. I think, uh, and I think this storm break is um, the, it's really important that we um, have this in place sooner rather than later because there has been a lot of speculation as to what it does and what it can't do, how it works and how it can't work. Um, and this codifies it in black and white so people can actually see it for itself as a very important part of that democratic check that your question started out on. As a former chief whip, um, I'm, I mean, I know there, there are going to be uh, future opportunities um, in, in, uh, on some of the things that Mark said and, and uh, future uh, SIs and Parliament will always find a way if the government doesn't allow it to have its say and I'm, I'm, I'm generally not particularly worried about that.
Thank you, Chairman. I, thank you. Uh, Geraint Davis, please. Hey, Chair. Um, now, the European Union was adamant that it wouldn't <coughs> re renegotiate the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, quite reasonably, because obviously that's signed in international law, which trumps both EU law and national law. So why do you think they've agreed to make these fundamental changes? Do you <coughs> think it's because it helps the peace process, helps the single market, helps inward investment, perhaps helps US investment? Why do you think they've changed their mind when they didn't need to? Um, I think it does all those things that you detail, but I don't think the European Union changed its mind because of that. Um, the opening mandate that the European Union had when initially negotiating the protocol was to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. When you see one of the key institutions from one of the strands of that agreement not functioning, um, I mean, you can ignore it for a certain period of time, but it was obvious it was not functioning because of the way that the current protocol is working in Northern Ireland. Um, and so, um, you know, I would love to say it was fantastic negotiating skills by a team of brilliant nego uh, negotiators on the, e on the UK side that persuaded the EU to make the treaty changes, and it was, obviously, by a gentleman. Um, but um, actually, I, I generally think it was because the, uh, as, as the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement uh, was materialising on the horizon, and understanding that actions, I always say that, that when this, when the protocol was written, when we all voted for the protocol, I know you didn't, Mr. Uh, Davies, but uh, I think pretty much the rest of us did. Oh, are you abstaining? I'm sorry. Mr. I, I, I voted against. I, oh, you voted against. Sorry. I'm, I'm in favour of the protocol. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I'm just, I'm just saying that, um, uh, you know, it, well, it, I don't think anybody envisaged the practical effects that the day-to-day -day operation of even the bit of the protocol that is now working has on the people of Northern Ireland, and certainly wouldn't have on, uh, didn't have that understanding of what it meant to the unionist community. Um, and so I think it's a general realization of the importance of the peace and stability that's been brought about by that agreement. So on that point then, do you think enough has been done to persuade all political parties, in particular the DUP, and what's in it for them? Because it, I've got to say, from where I'm sitting, it seems to me there's a lot in it for the DUP in terms of inward investment, jobs, peace, uh, you know, the United States putting more money in, British companies perhaps moving to Northern Ireland but finding it difficult to trade into the single market. You know, 50% are either trading less or none at all. So there's a lot of economic benefits and stability benefits for Northern Ireland for the DUP. But have you put enough effort into talking to the DUP about selling the, the, the benefits that have been negotiated with the consent of the EU? Um, I would, um, I mean, I, so I, I would, I, I try never, uh, and I've always done this throughout my political career, to second guess what other political parties might be doing because I'm not wired necessarily in that particular way. But I do think there is a- well, How would you sell it to the DUP? That's I think, there, I think there, I, I, so I think actually the Windsor framework, um, as it, um, comes to the fore with the Stormont mm -hmm. break enacted um, and indeed some of the other things that we need to do because the, the Democratic Unionist Party had seven key tests that it was testing what the government was trying to achieve against lots of them covered by I would say uh, uh, what we've done in the Windsor framework but some are actually more fundamental uh, than that because there's um, there's the uh, act of union piece that is fundamental to any unionist and the cons and, po and potentially the concern as to um, constitutional arrangements in the future i would say that um I, I truly believe hand on heart that this deal will bring better more more prosperity better uh, 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 to northern ireland and when you have more prosperity i think um nations are hi uh, un highly <laughs> unlikely to want to change their uh, their constitutional setup i think um, prosperity, and in fact, I think I could almost semi-quote, paraphrase the leader of the Democratic Unionist in, uh, Party, um, but everybody wants prosperity for Northern Ireland, and if we get this prosperity piece right, I think that helps guarantee the union for decades, generations to come.
Okay. And do you agree this hard wires economically Northern Ireland into the United Kingdom? Because if there is more inward investment, we'll get the tax, and we're not going to give up Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom in any hurry. So don't you think that's a strong argument for the DUP to consider? I, I, I believe that is the case, and I believe we will be trying to help codify some of that as well. Thanks. Okay, so um, just moving on. Um, Many of us see that the whole of this Windsor framework work is being rushed without sufficient consultation, and the facts speak for themselves. The government announced yesterday that the UK-EU Withdrawal <coughs> Agreement Joint Committee will meet on Friday to sign off the Windsor framework, and this will be after members debate a draft statutory instrument on the storm outbreak tomorrow, which, aside from <coughs> this session, will be the House's only formal opportunity to engage with the government on the deal. So will you agree will you agree that, that the Windsor framework comes into effect in the WAGC on Friday? That's the first question. Our elements of it do. Yeah. So why does the fr Windsor framework have to be agreed on Friday? Um, uh, so elements of it are part of the deal. There's actually uh, there's, there's a whole host of sequencing of, uh, of, of different events, but it is actually the 10th meeting, I believe, of this joint committee. Uh, this is, uh, it's not a, a, a new thing, it's just an evolution of the joint committee and uh, what it does. A pretty big step in the evolution, I should say, but what is the rationale for the timing of the SI vote tomorrow and then followed by the WAGC on Friday? Um, the rationale for the, I think I detailed the ra uh, rationale for the SI timing, and um, I honestly don't know why the Joint Committee is sitting on Friday, but the Joint Committee is sitting on Friday, I believe it, it, it's... I mean, some would argue very strongly that uh, this is rushing the process. Uh, when you announced the deal nearly a month ago, after at least four months of secret discussions with the EU, I mean, we, we were not aware of what was going to happen until we saw the uh, papers immediately before the part of Prime Minister's statement. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to apologise for um, people conducting negotiations in confidential situations because that's what businesses do and that's what we should be doing as a government. Um, and I think now having published um, everything on I think, whatever it was, the 27th of March, um, I'd like to think that we are giving the people the time and the space to critically um, go through uh, all aspects of this. So, Craig McKinley, would you like to ask the next question, please? Yeah, thank you. Just on to the, uh, the Stormont break. Uh, you said in your preamble uh, this afternoon that it allows a veto for the people of Northern Ireland. Now, just let us expand on that a little. Um, it, it only applies in some quite limited areas. It only uh, can come into play if there is amended or replacement EU law, so not all the old stuff, as it were. Uh, it doesn't apply on issues relating to state aid, VAT, excise, most of the customs code, trade, defence or the electricity market. So I think we have to accept that that broad use of the word veto is perhaps a little expansive compared to the truth. It has fairly narrow use. And there is a test that has to be met. And that test, and I'll, I'll quote it, is it would, an issue would, would have a significant impact specific to everyday life in Northern Ireland in a way that is liable to persist. <clears throat> now, a couple of questions arise out of that. Who interprets the word significant is, a, is an interesting point. Um, perhaps you'd like to start with Perhaps refreshing your, your thoughts on the w use of the word of a wide, wide-ranging veto, and who decides what is significant or not? MLAs decide. Thirty MLAs would decide what's significant, um, and uh, there is a veto at the end of this process through uh, in joint committee. Okay, but you, you, you do accept it's got fairly narrow scope ac across those areas that are specifically excluded, <coughs> and it only applies to new or amended. EU law? Um, so it applies to new, um, so it does not apply, you're quite right, to the existing body of EU law that currently, although lots of that, as I've said, is disapplied, but to the 3% um, of EU law that still uh, kind of flows through the system, uh, there is the bare minimum for uh, access to the uh, European single market. Um, then for new uh, 
laws or amended laws in that space, it, do, it does apply. In, for good, uh, Mark, would you like to just yeah. step in and... No, no, uh, I'm still I'm... waiting for this list of the laws that won't apply and what 3% will, of course, yeah, aren't yeah, we? We, we, you know, we? We're completely in the dark about those, which would have been helpful for tomorrow, I would have thought. I think, I think it is worthwhile saying um, it, it, does, it applies to um, the very significant uh, majority of things that are in uh, Annex 2 of the protocol uh, of, the, of the existing protocol and what will be the Windsor framework. That, is, that includes uh, a significant amount of the, of the rules that you're referencing there. It doesn't cover some of the ones that you're talking about, but in some of those areas we have other mechanisms. So there are other sort of forums for discussion but I think it's just important to note that um, the, the scope of this applies to the very significant majority of goods, goods rules, and those are the areas where those kind of impacts we're likely to see in practice. So that's, <coughs> that's the reason for how the, how the break is defined. I think I'll just add to that, Mark, as well. It does, I think you mentioned the customs code. It does apply to exactly. the, whole, the entire EU customs code. Yeah. That's actually listed there. The the whole um, uh, the whole customs code yeah. piece of EU law. So the break bites on any amendments and replacements to that where the where the conditions are met. Okay, let's just put our minds forward a bit. I'm I'm certainly hope. Will you be able to confirm to me, Secretary of State, uh, that the retained EU law bill is still on track to make its passage through this place? It was last time I checked. Yes. Good. Okay. Let's just pass, put our mind forward a bit if and when this place uh, agrees to retain the EU law bill, and we then have the opportunity... Chief, can we go when? Yes, when. Thank you. Good. Um, we will have the opportunity to do things that are right for a you know, global trading nation that the UK always should be. But what that does mean is that 48 years' worth of uh, accumulated EU law can be investigated, changed, amended, discarded, whatever we might please, um, obviously, Secretary of State's have a lot of uh, powers within that, no problem with that. But of course, that retained EU law bill, all those years' worth, will not apply to Northern Ireland. We will not be able to use the retained EU law bill to disapply stuff to Northern Ireland because we've got a set-in-stone date, which is departure day for us. We haven't had to apply the last three years' worth of of, of new corpus of law that's coming out of the EU. Northern <coughs> Ireland has had to have that whole 48 years worth plus the last three years, and yet its only ability through the Stormont break is to perhaps, after this quite circuitous route, let's, let's be very clear, of the application of the Stormont break can actually prevent future uh, law on trade matters applying to it. So does the retained EU law bill make an even bigger gap, a glaring gap, between GB and NI. Well, because see, if, if we it, can disapply I'm, the last 48 years' worth, they cannot. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to push back quite hard on how you describe the Stormont break, um, because it is not securitous. It is, it is a very, very straightforward way that elected members of the Legislative Assembly sitting in uh, Stormont. I mean, yes, there, there is a clarification there, Mr. Chairman. You have to be, Stormont has to uh, go back for this to uh, uh, come into effect. But how likely is that? Uh, forgive me to interrupt you. I don't, I, I, how likely are they going to change I, EU law I'm, when... I'm afraid you probably need to have someone else in this seat mm. to... Um, oh, how likely are MLAs? Um, it's going to be use... handed across to Northern Ireland to decide whether they invoke this what are the chances, realistically, of that ever happening? I don't know. You have to ask the members of the Legislative Assembly. But that goes, doesn't that go back to the point that Mr Smith was, was making, that that is, that is a point about sovereignty. And if members of the Legislative Assembly choose to, to use that, their sovereignty, then they absolutely can. 30 members of the Legislative Assembly mm. from two political parties, could be from one tradition or others, uh, or, n or none at all, can... Um, through uh, um, activate the the break and then a whole uh, essentially a process uh, starts that disapplies EU law and we can and actually could be vetoed in joint committee. Uh, forgive me for a minute, uh, Chairman, uh, Secretary of State. Um, you must mention the sovereignty of Northern Ireland, uh, which is a real problem because 
Northern Ireland doesn't have sovereignty. It's Westminster that has the sovereignty. I mean, you which is why it's, we it's Westminster that would um, uh, enact the veto. It is why this government, it would be the UK government that would enact the veto well, in the joint Craig committee. We'll come back in on that now. So, well, just just to, I mean, a point came up that was quite interesting just last Friday, and that was the uh, private members' bill on the hunting trophies import prohibition bill. And you know, widely supported across the House, all parties, certainly something that, that many of us would support, uh, that that should apply in, across the United Kingdom. And the Right Honourable Member for East Antrim asked the, the Minister, the, the, the Member for Copeland, uh, about why that will not apply, the, the trophy prohibition, in Northern Ireland. Now, that's a pretty small bit of legislation, hugely totemic, supported by this House, and I'm, I'm, I can but assume supported by most people in Northern Ireland, and yet because of the ongoing attachment to the single market rules uh, and trade rules under the EU, it cannot apply in Northern Ireland. Now, now, tell me in all honesty, does that sound like sovereignty? Does that sound like this Parliament acting on behalf of all of the peoples of the Union of the United Kingdom. I think, um, and I completely understand the point you're making um, on this issue, and you are uh, right that you know, this should be able to apply to the whole of the United Kingdom, but um, the law as it stands <coughs> that the vast majority of the people in this room voted for means that that is not the case. Does um, the Windsor framework solve and the, that? And the Windsor framework goes to solve new EU law uh, differentiation, and we'd have to change various things in the UK internal market Act and other places for uh, uh, unfettered trade to become a reality from NI to GB. Um, but I don't think it does solve this particular individual issue, um, because it will be part of those 3% of EU laws that apply um, for the, the bare necessity that apply for uh, applied for the access to the single market um, and therefore but if it were to if there was an EU law that was to change in this space then the, the, the storm on break could come into effect but I think that's the honest but, answer that individual case yep. of a small bit of law totemic as it is doesn't that highlight <clears throat> the difficulties of when we have the retained EU law bill that increasingly might change Sorry. some of these matters yeah, and I also didn't I mean, that to me shows how the REUL will not apply to Northern Ireland in the way that we may wish. So actually, I mean, so this is a, because it is a new law, that it's actually, you know, it's a new bill that is not actually a, a, a <coughs> law yet. So, uh, and um, my illustrious colleagues in DEFRA are looking at how they can make this apply um, uh, in Northern Ireland going forward. But I just on the, I didn't answer your point, I, I, and forgive me, about the retained EU law bill. And I don't think it is the case, as you suggest, because I, I've had plenty of submissions uh, advising me how difficult it would be for the Northern Ireland Civil Service to go through the body of retained EU law in Northern Ireland situ in the situation without an executive up and functioning and ministers uh, there uh, for, the, for them to do that. So um, either they're doing a body of work for no good reason or the retained EU law bill uh, will apply. Got Brendan, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think on the retained EU law bill, it's important to, that obviously applies to the whole body of retained EU law uh, that's in UK law, but that includes, for example, a vast amount of uh, rules that will apply in Northern Ireland on everything from immigration to financial services to procurement uh, to data to how we regulate artificial intelligence. To, I mean, we could, we could go on and we can, we can set that out in more, or more detail, but all of the changes to that re retained EU law will apply either UK-wide, if it's a reserved or accepted function, or if it's in the devolved space, then uh, we will, you know, ministers here will uh, legislate for England, and then it'll be up to the devolved administrations. And, um, I'd like to move on now, because we have here a member yeah, sorry, from course, Northern too. Ireland, um, who is a member of Parliament <coughs> in the United Kingdom Parliament, which does have the sovereignty. I'd be grateful, Mr Robinson, if you'd be kind enough to ask the next question. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Good afternoon, Secretary of State, um, and to your colleagues. Sure. Secretary of State, before this uh, evidence session, you were quoted publicly as saying that the storm and break would give members of the Legislative Assembly <laughs> the final say on the application of EU law, and this afternoon you suggested 
that members of the Legislative Assembly have a veto on the application of new or amending EU law. Do you accept that that is not the case? No, because of the way we are codifying what a minister has to do in the, in the, joint, in the joint committee. Um, I think the, the process is, is pretty much um, straightforward. I mean, there's a commitment that the government cannot agree, the government cannot agree to the application of a rule in the joint committee um, unless it has um, a vote in, in the Assembly on, cross, uh, on a cross-community agreement or it doesn't impose a new regulatory border within the United Kingdom or exceptional cir uh, circumstances. And I know people have looked at exceptional circumstances and thought, well, what could they be? Uh, and they could be something like foot and mouth or you know, some sort of plant State, There are, and I, I'm across the detail of uh, the Stormont break. Would it not be more honest to say that there are exceptional circumstances in which the government can exercise their vote irrespective of the view of elected representatives in the Northern Ireland Assembly. That's what Article 18 provides in the Stormont Break, and it gives government ministers, UK government ministers, their choice as to whether they exercise a veto or not. Would that not be a more honest assessment than suggesting that the Stormont Break is more than what it is? Um, I would hate to disagree with the Honourable Gentleman. Um, Perhaps it would be helpful yeah. if you could outline what you believe exceptional circumstances therefore deliver to the UK Government Minister who would be in the Joint Committee. Yeah, I, I, they can I, I, exercise I, that power without recourse to or taking account of the views of Assembly members. Is that not correct? But there will be a binding statutory obligation in domestic law on ministers to trigger the break when these conditions are met. It would be unlawful for ministers to refuse to notify the European Union that the break is being triggered because they're concerned about whatever it might be, potential EU remedial measures under Article 13.4 of the framework. And so the Secretary said both those aspects are right. They are there in the storm and break, but that does not lead anyone to conclude that it offers members of the Legislative Assembly a final say or indeed that they have a veto. Would you accept that? The actions of the members of the Legislative Assembly directly lead to the government's, uh, to the veto. Can directly lead, but they do not hold the veto. Uh, can directly lead to the veto. Secretary State, you've indicated that you would need to see the restoration of the institutions at Stormont for the Stormont break to apply. Which section of the SI indicates that? I think that's, um, it's made clear in a sort of international law text that we've agreed in terms of the conditions. So um, that is uh, an obligate, you know, that was part of the, the operation of the break that was agreed as part of it. And that's an important um, reflection for us about how it should operate, as in it is putting power in hands of the elected institutions in Stormont. So um, that is a, that's an international um, law condition around the use of the break. And it's also reflected in the fact that the government can make a notification under the SI only where the conditions in both Article 13 3A and the Unilateral Declaration are met and one of the conditions of the Unilateral Declaration are that the institutions are functioning. So it flows through that provision. We know there are volatilities within the institutions in Northern Ireland. Are there circumstances in which the break can be used when Stormont is not sitting? Uh, yes, once yeah. the... Um, it cannot begin to operate until the institutions are back and running. Thereafter, it's if, member, if the members seeking to use the break are looking to operate the institutions in good faith, and I think uh, the text sets out conditions like seeking to nominate ministers and support the normal operation of the assembly, then it could be used. So those are conditions that are in the, in the text of the joint committee decision, uh, and then that flows through into the SI as well. Secretary of State, you, you know that this SI is entitled the Windsor Framework democratic scrutiny regulations. I think you've already accepted that there is more to the threat of divergence uh, in Northern Ireland than just EU divergence. There is UK divergence. Yet through this evidence session, we understand that tomorrow's vote is the vote prior to the adoption of the Windsor framework on Friday. So can you give a sense to this committee what else we should expect 
on the operation and interoperability of law in Northern Ireland and how elected representatives from Northern Ireland can guard against a future divergence in whichever direction it may come. Yeah. And, um, and what Mr Robinson is articulating is that actually the, a lot of provisions in the UK Internal Market Act um, were not apply, uh, applicable for in, in the Northern Ireland context because of the operation of the protocol. We would need to uh, look at that. I, I believe can be done. Is that right? Through. Yeah, I just want to check I'm being, I'm being factually correct here. So. Yeah, I think we're, we're and the, the Prime Minister committed to saying that we would uh, strengthen the provisions. And the, there's a, a backstory here where in uh, 2020 the government removed some clauses from uh, the then UK Internal Market Bill on Northern Ireland's uh, businesses' access to, the, uh, to its most important market in the rest of the UK, irrespective of, of any differences across the... Um, uh, across the United Kingdom and the Prime Minister committed to now to restoring um, similar clauses in the UK Internal Market Act, which we can do and we can do now in, in compliance with international law. And then we've also set out other measures in the, uh, in the UK government's command paper, including um, uh, using and strengthening the role of the Office for the UK Internal Market, which is already there to, uh, and has a statutory role to monitor um, uh, the risks of divergence within the UK and make sure the UK internal market functions in a, in a smooth way. And just one further point, Mr Chairman, which I know is important to Mr Robinson, and quite rightly so, um, but the, in the government legal position that was published alongside the Windsor Framework documents um, on the 27th, it, um, it, the legal position states that the Windsor Framework addresses the government's position set out to, uh, in the July 21 Command paper, it respects the Act of Union and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and deals with the everyday issues people and businesses in Northern Ireland had faced as a result of the operation of the protocol in protecting, and it goes on to say, in protecting the economic rights of the people of Northern Ireland, ensuring uh, the just and equal treatment for the identity, ethos, and aspirations of both communities. Um, and whilst that's a, a lot of words, I think it's actually quite an important statement when it comes to the union moving forward. It's an important statement, Secretary of State, that's right. But uh, in the last preceding number of months, the government have argued in the UK uh, Supreme Court and before that in the Belfast High Court and Court of Appeal that Article 6 has been impliedly repealed. Are you constitutionally and legislatively satisfied that Article 6 of the Acts of Union is no longer impliedly <clears throat> repealed? And if so, can you share that advice? Um, the legal advice says that we that this the Windsor framework respects the Act of Union and so um, that's quite a different thing Secretary of State yeah so and I know do you have legal advice on whether article 6 of the Act of Union remains impliedly repealed or not because you'll know what the equal footing provisions are and you'll know that whilst you can argue categorically that there is progress through the Windsor framework you cannot categorically say that people in Northern Ireland, through all of these issues that have been raised thus far on divergence and different legislative framework and on uh, requirements for the movement of goods that we'll come on to and all the rest, is an equal footing. So I can only refer, because it is the correct place, to refer, <coughs> is to the government's legal position on this that was published alongside these documents. But as, the, uh, as, as Mr. Robinson knows, um, there is more work afoot to try and make sure that the, the clarifications can be made in both law and, and, and other ways as we move forward to, make, uh, to <coughs> put this issue where it should be to bed. One final question in this section, Chair, before I, I know Mr. Jones and Mr. Fish want to come in. Um, Secretary of State, you'll know in Article 14 there is a provision that precludes the uh, validity of notification um, precludes a minister from considering remedial action from the EU as a, a reason for not accepting the validity of notification. <coughs> you will have heard people previously say a minister will never exercise a veto for fear that there would be retaliatory action and at least on the notification and the validity of that notification that is explicitly mm. ruled out in this SI. Why does it not feature in Article 18 of the SI on the exercise of vote? A joint committee? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. 
Uh, I mean, I think, I think as, you've, as the Secretary of State set out, I think what we have provided there is a very significant set of safeguards um, at each stage. I think the duty on the government, as you make clear in um, paragraph 14, is there to ensure that there aren't irrelevant factors considered and whether or not the break is triggered. If MLAs make a valid notification to the government, the government is bound to notify. And so that is enshrined. That is a powerful safeguard. And there is also a very powerful safeguard in terms of what happens when the UK government makes decisions at the Joint Committee, uh, which are, as, as the Chair made clear, are sort of matters of ultimately of international affairs within the, um, within the sort of sovereignty of the, of the government and of Parliament. There, we have imposed one of the strongest constraints I think we have done on the, on, on the UK's um, powers in that regard. And I think we think that reflects the appropriate balance of what how and uh, how and in what circumstances ministers should be constrained and that means that they are precluded from agreeing to a rule where there isn't a cross-community vote in favour as the Secretary of State made clear they are precluded uh, and they can only do so if they are if they consider and these are factors they need to set out to Parliament they're accountable to Parliament for so doing where they think it doesn't impose regulatory borders or they consider there are exceptional circumstances uh, I think that reflects the, the fact that, as, as the Secretary of State made clear, there may be exceptional circumstances that um, would merit the adoption of the rule. And I think we consider we've provided the right balance of strong safeguards and respecting the, the ultimate role of the UK government. It doesn't feature as a standalone consideration when exercising the vote in the Joint Committee, but for the importance of parliamentary interpretation and potentially subsequent legal interpretation, can I ask you, Secretary of State, whether you are satisfied that the threat of remedial action from the European Union would not constitute an exceptional circumstance? Yes. And do your officials concur? Uh, I'm not seeking to, to sort of provide definitional um, elements here as to what as to what it means I think it's it's set out in the SI and the house will um, obviously have that is is part of the House's scrutiny I have to say mr. chairman that's why we're asking so so I, I think I've it's set out that in the that there are exceptional circumstances it's set out the ministers need to account for that uh, to Parliament and on those are the, the that's what it's also SI codified that it's, it's codified that ministers must not you have accepted, Secretary of State, that the threat of remedial action from the European Union is not an exceptional circumstances in the confines of Article or Paragraph 8. I, I can't believe it could be. Well, I would say the proof of the pudding is going to be in the easy, <coughs> isn't it? So now if I could pass to Marcus Fish. Uh, thanks. I've, I've, I've got a set of questions about the operation of the uh, Stormont break. But just, just on that remedial measures issue, I'm just interested, actually, um, how and to what extent um, are the... Uh, remedial measures that the EU might take uh, restricted uh, other than through what we were just discussing uh, versus what was there in the NIP? Yeah, I mean, so firstly, they have to be proportionate. Secondly, they have to apply to essentially Northern Ireland EU trade, not UK um, EU uh, uh, trade. And uh, there's a whole host of other areas of clarification that I can write to you and give. Well, yeah, I think it's an important the point up. that the, the remedial measures, sometimes the word before it in the treaty gets dropped, that they have to be appropriate. And so there would have to be, proportionality would hang off that. Um, obviously, the UK itself would have the rights to challenge that through normal, independent, international arbitration. And I think the alternative um, scenario that you talked about, I think the, the problem there, and, and it would have to be proportionate to the relevant rule that had been... Uh, vetoed, which is which is obviously becomes by its nature much more restrictive. I think the challenge with the alternative scenario, particularly because of the the the, the interlinkages between the trade and cooperation agreement and the withdrawal agreement, where there are sort of cross retaliatory provisions between the two separate treaties, uh, meant that breaches oh, breaches of the withdrawal agreement, which which the veto under Article 13.4 is not, it's an envisaged veto, are uh, now um, strengthened significantly by the break breaches do would give the EU the ability to take much broader retaliatory measures across the whole swathe of uh, UK EU trade as the Secretary of State set out so basically all goods <coughs> trade which affect Northern Ireland businesses and businesses across the UK whereas the the 13 for appropriate remedial measures is a much 
uh, tighter context specific scenario specific um, uh, situation and where the UK has our own rights to challenge that if it's done in a disproportionate way. Just one extra point, just, if, I, if I may, just one sentence. Um, that in, th there's a contrast here between the Windsor Framework and the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill because that bill would have given the EU the ability to levy tariffs on all trade. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So um, The uh, command paper says that the Stormont break is not subject to the oversight of the Court of Justice and any dispute would be resolved through arbitration applying international law. Are you confident that there are no circumstances in which the Court of Justice would be involved? What, for example, would happen if the arbitration panel considered that the dispute involved a question of EU law, say um, the arbitration panel took the view that the question of whether a replacement EU Act was significantly different from the one it replaced was a matter of EU law, and to what extent does the fact of the quantum of harm to Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland trade having been identified by 30 MLAs prior to that, um, to what extent is that within scope of the arbitration panel to look at overriding such questions of EU law significance? I mean, that is why it's, it, it goes to the arbitration panel and not to the uh, European judges. The, the whole point of this is that um, this is all under, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is all under um, strand uh, one type territory of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a domestic um, addition uh, which we are enacting. It's down to us to, uh, to enact this. It's been accepted by the European Union as a, uh, uh, as a, as a process. And I just think, it, um, I mean, to me, when if something got to the arbitration panel, it would uh, it would be a very in, it, it would be an interesting demonstration that this has actually worked, um, because that would have meant that we would have uh, gone through the process. The break would have been applied. The, the, the measure would have been uh, put aside by the uh, joint committee, and then the EU would have said that's not that's <coughs> just not correct, and um, and that would be a, I think a pretty good demonstration that the break does what it says on the tin. And I think it would do what it says on the tin because it is, it is a new democratic safeguard inserted at the heart of the treaty. And um, I haven't used many quotes yet today, Mr. Chairman, but there's one from um, one of Michel Barnier's top advisors who, who said that the break, it does amount to a clear veto possibility for the UK government directive by directive at the behest of a minor minority in the Northern Ireland Assembly. And the arbitration mechanism um, does not have to reflect ECJ. But could I just ask this question? So you're stating, to go back to what Marcus Fish asked just now, that there are no circumstances in which the Court of Justice would be involved. Are you confirming that? I believe so. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the condition, for instance, that uh, Mr. Fish discusses is an objective condition set out in Article 13, in Article 13.3a. That is not covered by ECJ's jurisdiction, so that should be a judgment of fact for the arbitration panel to reach. So our view is that there is no role for the ECJ in the operation of the Stormont break, either during it or during any period, uh, any process of the EU challenging it. I think the EU uh, on its own materials have acknowledged the point that it's a matter for the ECJ. So um, that is, you know, that's the base on which we're operating. And that's certainly our view. Well, that is the, your view. And the question which I put to you is, is it of interest to you if people put forward another proposition which says the Court of Justice would be involved in certain circumstances? Uh, that wouldn't be the government's view. We do so not consider I've, that it does have one. I heard what you said. So we'll now move on to the next question. If I well, yeah, yes, of course. My, um, my final um, question is in the area of NI manufacturing and what it can or can't do to GB standards. Um, uh, because um, as I see it at the moment, what the Windsor frame Framework proposes is essentially that NI manufacturing remains under the auspices of, of EU law and standards for manufacturing which is what you referred to before, Secretary of State, as being a thing which Northern Ireland businesses wanted. Um, but I wondered to what extent the government was committed to looking at the evolution of that position so that it may, if, for example, it is shown through this process of Green Lane that, in fact, there are robust mechanisms for 
ensuring that the EU can be confident that goods are not moving into their uh, uh, territory, that in fact uh, Northern Ireland businesses might be able in the future to, uh, to, to have an option to manufacture to uh, U UK standards and law and therefore participate properly in the internal market supply chains back and forth from GB that could let them take advantage of, for example, future trade deals that we might do with CPTPP or the US. Um, and I just wondered how committed is the government to, to evolving this in the future and, and really championing Northern Ireland manufacturing in, in that way? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I know Mr. Uh, Mr. Fish is an expert on these matters, and we've had many a conversation about this um, in the past. Um, the, the one thing I'd say about the manufacturing standards piece is that most of these, all of these pretty much, oh, those that have standards are international standards that both the EU and the UK subscribe to. Um, I believe we have diverged um, out of 3,600 odd of these international manufacturing standards, we, we have diverged um, in, I think it is 11 of them since um, uh, in, 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 in recent time, and um, but we have both the UK and the European Union have agreed in the TCA to follow international standards. So we're talking about we're talking about slightly different thing. That's a slightly different thing to what I was more asking about, because at the moment goods goods have to uh, uh, take take account of different rules of origin when 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 they're. Uh, passing back and forth into the U in, into GB and out uh, to Northern Ireland, so they they are potentially subject to cu customs yeah, con controls of one <coughs> kind or another, yeah, and as a result can't quite participate yet. Maybe there's scope in the future, and I, I would like to hear the government uh, commit to that um, because I think that that's going to be important for the future of the UK Union and for Northern Ireland. Yeah, I think just on the rules of origin piece, it's important to explain that the um, one of the advantages of the green lane and the way it will operate under the joint committee uh, agreement within the Windsor framework is that it won't, for these GBNI green lane movements, the, the rules of origin won't matter for, for, the, for the movement. You know, there, won't, there isn't any looking behind that. The only the question is, obviously, you have to in initially be authorised, you're in the trusted trader scheme, and you have to show that your good is for final consumption and sale and use in Northern Ireland. But yeah. it doesn't matter that the, the good may have originally come from the rest of the world into GB. Mm -hmm. Unlike a sort of normal, uh, unlike if you were, for example, Hollyhead to Dublin, where you'd have to have to claim tariff-free status, you would need to have your rules of origin certificate. Mm -hmm. It would depend on the rules of origin as to whether you could claim that. That won't be relevant for the operation of the Green Lane scheme between GB and, and well, but um, But you put your finger on it when you said that the Green Lane is only open to things that are destined for final <coughs> consumption in NI rather than being then available for uh, incorporation in, in, into a supply chain that goes back into GB, for example, for re-export so that there's a sort of uh, a kind of a processing function in Northern Ireland that they can't take advantage of the green lane yet. Maybe, I hope, that that can change in the future. I don't know what you think. Yeah, oh, and, sorry. Yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are um, you know, it can, because we manage within the Windsor framework, it expands the, even for processing where the good is being sort of transformed in Northern Ireland. There are still uh, the provisions now in the Windsor framework that deal with those scenarios as well, yeah. for example, okay. the sort of food processing. If we could move on, I, I think David Jones got the next question. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, you will recall, Secretary of State, that the command paper said that uh, the um, Windsor framework would reduce, uh, as it put it, the, or ra rather narrow the range of EU rules applicable in Northern Ireland to less than 3% overall by the EU's own calculations. And when the Prime Minister made his statement to the House on the 27th of <coughs> February, um, I asked him if he would kindly provide a list of those uh, rules so that the House could assess its impact. Um, Prime Minister replied that he was happy to look at that, uh, and then he went on, on to say that he thought that the list already existed. Um, we haven't actually seen the list, uh, despite this committee having twice requested it. Uh, and similarly, uh, I tabled a written question 
requesting that list and didn't receive it. I just had the obfuscation that is sadly so common when one raises written questions. It wasn't to your department, it was to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, you, sh you should always ask for my department. Very is, there, is there such a list? Um, well, let me, let me so on the, on the claim, we've actually erred on the side of caution in terms of how we sought to calculate the effect of these changes, but it's not, it generally isn't as simple as one list because some rules are disapplied for the green lane in support of internal UK trade and some apply in the red lane. But it is clear in the text that there are swathes of areas where EU rules do not apply in internal UK trade which safeguards Northern Ireland's place in our union. Um, UK food and drink safety rules apply on agri-food retail trade. UK-wide licensing of medicines are done by UK authorities apply, allowing plants to move on the basis of a UK-wide plant passport scheme, removing burdens from customs bureaucracy, including uh, all declarations for all consumer parcel movements, enabling zero rates on VAT for heat pumps, solar panels, and delivering on alcohol duty changes across the whole so EU. Can I, can I, can and protecting the unfettered you? access to um, uh, uh, food and drink, there are 65, this applies for 65 core regulations uh, through Annex 1 of the SPS legal text. Can we have the list? Um, I will, and as I say, it's not as simple as a one list, but I will send you the, the ver a very long list um, of, well, that, that's, the, of, that, of that's the what we asked for areas um, of this. The, 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 the expression uh, used is is rather curious. It narrows the range of EU rules. It doesn't say it reduces the number of EU rules, um, and then it refers to three percent overall. Three percent of what? The overall gambit of EU law that applied through the Northern Ireland so Protocol. So in other words, 97% of EU law is being swept away, is that right? It's disapplied. So that's, um, we're left with 3%, which is obviously a small proportion, so you will kindly provide us with, with a list of those, or at least let us have an explanation. Um, also, there was the reference to the 1,700 pages of EU law, which I think you conceded was an unusual expression because it depended on the size of the font. Yeah, I'm sure we can make um, it a lot more if you wanted. It, well, yes, but, but uh, again, I've actually asked for, for, for details of those and I haven't had them. Uh, is there any co uh, difficulty in, in providing those? Um, I honestly, I, mean, I, I don't think so, is the simple answer. I mean, it's a lot of paper. Um, in the, just, to, just to give you an example of... I didn't want the pages, I just wanted a list. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Right. But, but just, if I may just give you one brief example as to why. <laughs> uh, through Annex 1 of the SPS legal text, which disapplies the 65 core EU regulations imp um, uh, implementing acts that, and implementing acts that flow from them, that covers over 1,000 pages of food safety and commercial protect, uh, consumer protection rules that includes marketing standards from sardines to wine, food supplements and additives, vitamins and minerals in food, as well as nutrition and health claims, GMOs pre and precision breeding, the production of wine, honey, and natural mineral waters, production of organic uh, uh, good products. And then there's a whole piece about uh, certification and there's a whole piece about prohibitions. But I will happily You're clearly give you, reading from you know, a, so I'm a, gonna send you what I've there. got. If, if, you don't, if you don't mind, if I send you what I have that, that and, be... and then direct you, I'd rather not send you the thousand pages of <laughs> no, food. I, I, I don't know. Um, what was the difficulty in providing the list when we asked for I it twice? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Um, well, one other point. Um, Miss, uh, Mr. Smith uh, raised the issue of Parliament having its say, which was promised by the Prime Minister uh, on the 27th of February. Um, is there going to be the sort of debate that everybody assumed that that would be? In other words, uh, say a full day's debate on the floor of the House when the whole issue of the uh, framework can can be discussed by, by members? I also don't know. I mean, that is for the Prime Minister and the parliamentary business managers, but I very much hope so. I, I mean, it's going to be rather late in the day because there's going to be the grand signing on Friday with Mr Shevchevic present, isn't there? Um, there's going to be the joint committee on Friday with Mr Shevchevic yes. so, so by that stage, really, the bird will have flown, won't it? Um, no, I, I think... As I said earlier, in my time as Chief Whip, Parliament always manages to find a way in having it say, um, I, I don't... Not a think. huge amount of time is there if, it's, if this is happening on Friday. I, 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 this is part of the process which we're going through now. Just for clarification, j just to repeat, the vote tomorrow on the SI is not intended to imply Parliament's approval of the Westminster framework as a whole, is that right? Uh, 
No, it is not intended. It is a vote on a statutory instrument, um, which, um, which uh, I, I will say in my speech um, that this is this is a vote on a statutory instrument um, on the Stormont uh, uh, break, which I think is actually. I mean, it's. What is, I, I think you can say it's a, it's a vote on the Windsor framework as it affects. Um, people, I mean, I think people are taking it as that vote. Whether it is or not is probably down. To, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah, I yeah, well, what does the government intend it to, to be? Um, my, uh, my intention is that it's a vote on the it's SI. A it's a discrete vote on one element of the framework and not the framework as a whole. Is that I'm right? Told that number 10, I've said it is. Yeah, I, th I, think, the position, I think the position is that the, uh, the, the debate and the instrument is um, on the Stormont break, but obviously we wouldn't be able to proceed with the Joint Committee on Friday if the House didn't um, exactly. uh, didn't approve that. So it was important that uh, we had a moment in, in the House before, in advance of the Joint Committee, which obviously formally changes the treaty. It's not actually strictly necessary to do that because the Parliament's already given ministers the power to change the treaty within the Joint Committee and chose to do that as part of the Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. But the has been promised that it will have its say. I think, as, as, as uh, Downing Street have set out, that you know we'll, it will be a say. It's impossible. To, it was not possible to move forward with the joint committee um, on Friday without the House's approval to the storm breaks. It's a central change to the so treaty, and there'll be a series of other domestic instruments coming down the track. Appreciate that. that will but, but, but just for clarification, are you telling this committee that the Downing Street intends that the vote tomorrow? Shall be Parliament's say effectively on the Windsor framework as a whole. So I think it's Parliament's say on the on the on the statutory instrument as, as set out for the well, storm at break. But what, what, what does Downing Street say? <laughs> yeah, as, as I say, this, they, you know, it's it's a, it's a debate and vote on the on the statutory instrument. But number ten have said that um, that will be. Uh, that will be taken as a, uh, an overall say on the Windsor framework itself, because without that, it would be impossible for us to move forward with the. It is absolutely so, so for, for, Forgive me. So, so that, that's that, that's Downing Street's intention. So, Parliament having its say will comprise 90 minutes debate on a single statutory instrument, and Number 10 will be saying that that is approval of the Windsor framework as a whole. Is that, do, do I understand that correctly? I think it, it's important to say that won't be, uh, that will not be the final moment of parliamentary scrutiny and say, because we'll need, as we've set out, I think there'll be an extensive programme. As I say, the Parliament's already given ministers powers in relation to the Joint Committee. Uh, that was set out at the point of ratification in, domestic, in primary legislation. Uh, what this is doing is bringing forward an instrument to make sure that there is a moment before we have the Joint Committee on Friday, and there'll be lots of... Uh, you know, we're planning on legislating for hopefully VAT cuts that can take effect very quickly after the Joint Committee and there'll be a separate piece of legislation on those. So there'll be a series of, um, quite an extensive series of opportunities for scrutiny and, and votes on these issues. Secretary of State, you, you, you said that Parliament usually finds its way to have its say. Um, put it this way, the government isn't volunteering time, uh, uh, government time, to have uh, uh, the sort of full debate that I think everybody anticipated there would be uh, on the framework and which we were given to believe would be the case when the Prime Minister made his statement on the 27th of September. Well, the storm break is an integral part of what we are. <laughs> of, it's a new novel procedure. It's an uh, integral part of what we're trying, uh, trying to achieve through in the whole of the win uh, Windsor framework. And I guess... I. I mean, Parliament does always find its way um, to express its views. Um, I, I'd like to think, actually, that the storm break is, is, uh, is something that's genuinely worth voting for, um, because essentially not voting for it is, is, by implication, voting for the continuation of automatic alignment of EU laws without a say for the people of Northern Ireland. But. Um, uh, it is it is in, important in the in the um, it's an important part that will be discussed again on Friday at the joint committee, which is why I believe it's been tabled for this time. Thank you. We have two questions left, so Thanks. if I could perhaps, uh, I think Mr. Robinson wanted to ask a follow up on that. Very quickly, a very quick Mr. Moment, Chairman, please. to clarify an answer given to Mr. Jones, um, Secretary of State, you were asked three percent of what. 
Uh, and you indicated that it was 3% of the laws that applied under the Northern Ireland Protocol, mm -hmm. suggesting 97% of the laws under the Northern Ireland Protocol have been disapplied. That can't be right, can it? Well, uh, common agricultural policy. Are you sure it's not 3% of EU law? No. Overall. Yeah. Overall, nothing to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol? Through the Northern Ireland Protocol. Thank you. Thank okay, you. and Mr. Drax, you wanted to ask a quick question. It's just very quickly. Yes. Uh, um, Secretary, you, you kept saying uh, we all voted for this, as if <clears throat> we're all in this together and it's all our fault yeah. that we're in this situation. Uh, can I just remind you, would you not agree that the protocol was based on the fact that we would then negotiate, quote, with best endeavour, best endeavour, to, to find a way forward? The United Kingdom has, for years since the Brexit debate, used every single tool in the box to try and move forward. And now, after a negotiation behind closed doors, we're even more trapped, or Northern Ireland is, and the United Kingdom, in the EU, EU than we were before. Whatever you say, the Northern Ireland Protocol is still in place, slightly amended. That's the truth of the matter. The Northern Ireland Protocol is still in place and will be amended and is being amended Slightly. by the Windsor Framework. I would say fundamentally. You would? I would. <coughs> Others would disagree. So now, Mr. Barron has arrived, and I'm very glad to ask him if he'd like to ask a question. That's kind of you, Chair. I'll, I'll just one very quick question. My apologies to everybody, but I've been participating in the budget debate uh, as, uh, as a member of the Treasury Select Committee. Very briefly, Secretary of State, um, I may be in a minority when I say this, but I support the Windsor Framework. Um, but my question to you is this. We, we do have to be pragmatic as Brexiteers, do we not, in moving this whole debate forward. And we've got the access now to trade that binds the United Kingdom. But can I put this suggestion to the Secretary of State, to you, and that is that whilst Brexit was always something more than just about trade, it was about sovereignty, it was about controlling uh, immigration, uh, uh, free trade agreements and all the rest of it. Northern Ireland, if we do get this through, the Windsor Framework, could stand at the cusp of a double good whammy in the sense that it will have access to the UK market as well as the EU single market. I mean, that could attract a lot of windward investment, couldn't it? Uh, you may have touched on it, you may have not, I don't know. But isn't that a, not a potential opportunity that we should not underestimate? I would generally... I, I did mention this earlier in um, this session, um, but generally, hand on heart, I do believe this will lead to greater prosperity in Northern Ireland, which strengthens Northern Ireland's place in the Union. As I said earlier, the proof of the pudding is going to be the eating on that one. Uh, Mr Holloway, please. Thanks very much. Um, does this solve or potentially exacerbate community divisions? And uh, is there a further bite of the cherry available after this? Or is, um, it, is this it? Yeah, no. So, I mean, I, I actually... I'd like to think what this has done, what the Windsor Framework has done, has um, set a new tone in the, the relationship between the United Kingdom having left the European Union and the European Union itself. There are elements, um, I believe, I'm not, so, uh, someone previously, I think, on this committee has asked about um, the uh, grace period that's uh, currently in place for veterinary medicines. We, we need to negotiate that it runs but, sorry, but what about what about what about power sharing what about oh no sorry I was, I was, I was yeah. answering your second part of your question first please forgive me um and so the, the but i do think that based on that better setting in the eu uk relationship lots more can be done between between us that is positive for us both and positive for northern Ireland. on power sharing my, uh, my, as I said at the very beginning, and it is absolutely the case, my primary objective as Secretary of State is to get the, um, the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly up and running because that is integral to the, um, both uh, for good democratic practice, for delivery of public services in Northern Ireland. Um, and I do believe that uh, this the Windsor framework eliminates all the negative aspects of the, of the protocol as it currently stands and would have come in as these periods of time, grace periods have been eliminated, um, which meant that one section, one, one, one community in Northern Ireland felt so aggrieved that its politicians felt they had to leave um, mm. the Strand One institution. Mm. And I do believe this goes some way to solving that issue. Does anybody have but, 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 but I mean, it clearly has it's some way, but I mean, you've still got, uh, you've still got the DUP 
not there. I mean, it hasn't solved anything. Well, that's a, I mean, so I believe the leader of the DUP, while saying he, um, what he said yesterday, w w talked about the progress that has been made. And I believe we have made a great deal of progress. And it's actually now, um, it's down to the political leaders and, and parties in Northern Ireland to look at uh, look at this, which is why we are giving people the time and the space to examine what it does. Well, could I just ask Gavin Rob Robinson if he'd like to just comment on yeah. that, please? <laughs> Gavin, <do you> want <laughs> to, uh, Gavin, if you want to swap seats, I've got a couple of questions. <laughs> We're very happy to assume the Secretary of State seat, Mr Chairman, if that's what uh, people so wish. <laughs> Right, Otherwise, so I'm not giving it. The question, was, the question was whether or not this will help that, no. restoring power sharing. I, look, can I, can I make one can, further? Can you answer? Okay. It is not for me to answer a question like that in this session, Mr Chairman. See, if to say this, tomorrow we were presented with a singular proposition on the storm and break, mm -hmm. which now manifests itself into a global choice on the Windsor framework, which does not and is not honouring the commitments to give time and space to assess the totality of issues associated with what the government have provided. Well, I think on that point, I think we'll have to complete the session today. Thank you very much, Secretary of State, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And um, no doubt we'll be carrying on this discussion into the indefinite future. Excellent. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Master of two. Definitely. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.